Part Two, Chapter Seven of O Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. O Pioneers, by Willa Cather. Part Two, Neighboring Fields, Chapter Seven. Marie's father, Albert Tavesky, was one of the more intelligent Bohemians who came west in the early seventies. He settled in Omaha and became a leader and adviser among his people there. Marie was his youngest child, by a second wife, and was the apple of his eye. She was barely sixteen and was in the graduating class of the Omaha High School when Frank Shabata arrived from the old country and set all the Bohemian girls in a flutter. He was easily the buck of the beer gardens, and on Sunday he was a sight to see, with his silk hat and tucked shirt and blue frock coat, wearing gloves and carrying a little wisp of a yellow cane. He was tall and fair, with splendid teeth and close cropped yellow curls, and he wore a slightly disdainful expression, proper for a young man with high connections, whose mother had a big farm in the Elba Valley. There was often an interesting discontent in his blue eyes, and every Bohemian girl he met imagined herself the cause of that unsatisfied expression. He had a way of drawing out his cambric handkerchief slowly, by one corner, from his breast pocket, that was melancholy and romantic in the extreme. He took a little flight with each of the more eligible Bohemian girls, but it was when he was with little Marie Tavesky that he drew his handkerchief out most slowly, and, after he had lit a fresh cigar, dropped the match most despairingly. Any one could see, with half an eye, that his proud heart was bleeding for somebody. One Sunday, late in the summer after Marie's graduation, she met Frank at a Bohemian picnic down the river and went rowing with him all the afternoon. When she got home that evening, she went straight to her father's room and told him that she was engaged to Shabata. Old Tavesky was having a comfortable pipe before he went to bed. When he heard his daughter's announcement, he first prudently corked his beer bottle and then leaped to his feet and had a turn of temper. He characterized Frank Shabata by a bohemian expression which is the equivalent of a stuffed shirt. "'Why don't he go to work like the rest of us did? His farm in the Elbe Valley, indeed! Ain't he got plenty brothers and sisters? It's his mother's farm, and why don't he stay at home and help her? Haven't I seen his mother out in the morning at five o'clock with her ladle and her big bucket on wheels, putting liquid manure on her cabbages? Don't I know the look of old Eva Shabata's hands? Like an old horse's hoofs they are! and this fellow wearing gloves and rings. Engaged, indeed! You aren't fit to be out of school, and that's what's the matter with you. I will send you off to the Sisters of the Sacred Heart in St. Louis, and they will teach you some sense, I guess." Accordingly, the very next week, Albert Tavesky took his daughter, pale and tearful, down the river to the convent. But the way to make Frank want anything was to tell him he couldn't have it. He managed to have an interview with Marie before she went away, and whereas he had been only half in love with her before, he now persuaded himself that he would not stop at anything. Marie took with her to the convent, under the canvas lining of her trunk, the results of a laborious and satisfying morning on Frank's part, no less than a dozen photographs of himself, taken in a dozen different lovelorn attitudes. There was a little round photograph for her watch-case, photographs for her wall and dresser, and even long narrow ones to be used as bookmarks. More than once the handsome gentleman was torn to pieces before the French class by an indignant nun. Marie pined in the convent for a year, until her eighteenth birthday was passed. Then she met Frank Shabata in the Union Station in St. Louis, and ran away with him. Old Tavesky forgave his daughter because there was nothing else to do, and bought her a farm in the country that she had loved so well as a child. Since then her story had been a part of the history of the Divide. She and Frank had been living there for five years, when Carl Lindstrom came back to pay his long-deferred visit to Alexandra. Frank had, on the whole, done better than one might have expected. 
He had flung himself at the soil with a savage energy. Once a year he went to Hastings, or to Omaha, on a spree. He stayed away for a week or two, and then came home and worked like a demon. He did work. If he felt sorry for himself, that was his own affair. End of chapter 7 of section 2